वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनीता भेला फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी अबाउट अ पीरियड कॉल्ड द रेनेसा दिस मॉड्यूल ऑन द रेनेसा हैज बीन प्रिपेयर बाय डॉक्टर चारुल जैन फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश ऑफ द महाराजा साया जी राव यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ बड़ौदा वडोदरा द रेनेसा इज अ पीरियड characterized by great developments in the field of poetry music art and architecture this period from the 14th to the 17th century is broadly classified as the renaissance the renaissance started in italy and from there spread to different parts of europe it was a gradual spread and therefore we have different uh it was a gradual spread and therefore we have the italian renaissance the french renaissance and the english renaissance in this module we will be concentrating more on the english renaissance the word renaissance comes from french re that is back or again and latin nascentia or french nascence to be born the renaissance followed the middle or the dark ages the dark ages were marked by intermittent wars and invasions and there was not much emphasis on advancement of learning and knowledge except in the domain of religion and church however with the fall of constantinople and the fall of the roman empire there was an exodus of greek and roman scholars who went to italy and took with them all the classical texts which when they reached italy became of great interest and they were translated and critiqued the emphasis in the classical texts was on human beings these texts were studied and there was a great revival of these classical texts that took place the renaissance which began in italy slowly spread to other parts of europe there were a number of factors that led to the renaissance as i said earlier the fall of constantinople to the turks in 1453 contributed to the exodus of greek scholars to take shelter in italy hence many manuscripts were transported to italy and became known to italian scholars at the same time there was the development of the printing press the development of the printing press helped to make many copies of great books which till then were unique and not available to many people thus a spread of the ancient knowledge to various readers and scholars took place these scholars undertook to translate and revive these ancient texts and hence the europeans became acquainted with a vast body of scholarship what was the process of reawakening or revival the greatest contribution of the renaissance was in establishing a shift in perception towards the position of human beings human beings were now exalted and placed at the center of the universe this was in stark contrast to medieval scholasticism which placed total emphasis on god the divine and the church the classicist thinkers of greece and rome too had placed man at the center of the universe in opposition to 
what had taken place in the medieval ages. Because in the medieval ages, the priests emphasized God as supreme and humans as degraded. As a result, there was a cultural movement during the Renaissance and this came to be known as humanism. What was humanism? Humanism was a rationalist system of thought, a set of values that gave main importance to humans rather than the divine. The focus was on human achievements and human potential rather than theological doctrines and dilemmas. What became important during this period? It was the study of humanities. History, poetry, philosophy, grammar and rhetoric all became equally important and exalted the status of human beings in the universe. Humanism moved away from medieval scholasticism and rekindled interest in the ancient Greek and Roman classics and their way of thinking. The medieval versus the humanists' views. What was the medieval attitude? The medieval attitude was that it was essential to acquire a knowledge of the classical languages, that is Latin and Greek, and they believed that they should serve as the models of other languages. The humanist views, they believed that grammar and composition should be modeled on the basis of the vernacular languages because these languages were not exactly uh, similar to the classical models. The humanists believed in cultivating the vernacular languages over the languages of the elite. Thus, the invention of the printing press, the availability of the classical Greek and other texts, and the development of the movement called humanism led to the flowering of new ideas, developing of critical insights, and also novel ways of thinking. During this period, because there was a lot of emphasis on human beings, there was placed a lot of emphasis on the right kind of education that was needed so that the right kind of men could be trained to rule others. There was also the need to define the traits that were needed to be inculcated in men to ensure that they develop the right virtues. As a result, several works came up on the subject. The first book that comes to mind is Castiglione's The Courtier, written in 1561. Originally in Latin, it was lately, later translated into English and discusses the talents and virtues ideally required in a courtier. Another book of great importance for this period is Sir Thomas Eliot's The Book of the Governor. It was the first book of education in England. It was a treatise on moral philosophy and education. And it placed a lot of emphasis on the reading of literature. The book recommends Homer for his wisdom as well as courage and boldness. Eliot alludes to several classical masters like Aristotle, Virgil and Homer for the exemplification of both moral instruction and the pleasure of reading. Sir Thomas Eliot in the book of Governor states that anything which is morally instructive, it could be comedy or it could be dancing. 
should be valued and pursued. Comedy can be morally instructive. Why? Because it is a mirror of man's life. He also emphasized that young minds should be trained to discern between good and evil. And therefore, in order to be able to discern good from evil, it was essential to show evil in literature. Because only by showing the ill effects of evil could the young mind learn to inculcate ideas of goodness. Eliot, though a humanist, approved of the medieval notion of a universal order. He believed in the hierarchical order of things in the universe and man's infinitesimal place in the order of those things. Another important educationist of this period was Roger Ackham. He wrote the book The Schoolmaster. In the first book, Teaching the Bringing Up of Youth, Askham gave a lot of practical advice to the young. He was totally against corporal punishment and cruel treatment of boys at school. He was critical of Mallory's Maud the Arthur and he also expressed his dissatisfaction with the two important themes of the text that is manslaughter and bold bordery because he believed that they set unworthy examples for the youth to follow. His second book, Teaching the Ready Way to the Latin Tongue. In this book, Askim emphasizes that the only way to learn any language, whether it is the mother tongue or a learned language, is only through imitation. He says that if anyone wants to speak as the best and the wisest do, then that person must be conversant with the best and the wisest. In his book, he cites examples of how all renowned poets have followed their predecessors, and that is those who are the best and the wisest. He also gives examples that need to be followed to develop different attributes in language learning. During this time, a number of people had started writing poetry. Therefore, it was considered imperative that people be taught the craft of poetry writing so that they could take examples from the learned classical masters. George Gascoon, a poet as well as a dramatist, wrote certain notes on instruction concerning the making of verse or rhyme in English. Gascoon's uh, certain notes on instruction concerning the making of verse or rhyme in English is considered the first essay in English on the art of versification. Gascoon elaborated on the technical aspects of versification like word order, stanza form and rhyme schemes. He also explained the system of scansion in detail. He emphasized the importance of fine invention. He said that poets should use poetic conceits but they should not use obvious poetic conceits. Like when you are writing a poem, you might want to say that this lady's cheeks are as red as a rose. But then it is a commonplace conceit. 
Cascione emphasized the need for using conceits which were not ordinary but rather imaginative and expressive. He also placed a great deal of importance on the use of surprise and also on varying the terms related to the theme. As I said earlier, he emphasized the avoidance of conventional conceits and obvious phrases. Another significant work of this period was George Puttenham's The Art of English Poesy. In the first section of The Art of English Poesy, titled Of Poets and Poesy, Puttenham praises the poets. He calls them the first priests, the first prophets, the first legislators and politicians in the world. He also divides poetry into a number of categories. Religious poetry that deals with the religious themes, didactic poetry which gives instructions and which is moral in nature, satirical and also he talked about the writing of epitaphs. George Puttenham also praised and critiqued the poets who wrote before him, White and Surrey, Chaucer, Gower, Raleigh. Puttenham in his second section of the book, The Art of English Poesy, titled Of Proportion Poetical, emphasizes the visual appeal of stanzas in poetry. He describes the various shapes into which poetry, in which poetry can be written. And uh, you will be seeing some examples of the various shapes uh, of the different styles uh, that he talked about. Poetry could be written in the shape of triangles or pillars or tapers or lozenges. And this, according to Puttenham, would make the verse more attractive to the reader. In the third section of his book titled Of Ornament, Puttenham describes the various kinds of figurative devices that can be used in versification and in order to do this, he gives various examples. During this period, both drama and poetry flourished. As a result, a number of works of poetry and drama came up that were not standard or that were not considered good. Hence, there were a number of scholars who attacked poetry and poets and the playwrights. And many charges were leveled against poetry and drama. And it was said that it was becoming morally degraded. During this time, uh, the, although the classical models were being followed and yet the English poets and playwrights were not strictly following the classical rules. A mixing of tragedy and comedy was taking place. And the three unities as prescribed by Aristotle were not always followed. And many who were proponents of the following of the classical models found this inappropriate. There was a lot of discussion and controversy that ensued. Several writers wrote against immoral and profane writings and were in favor of good poetry. They justified good poetry and the value of the works created by good poets and good playwrights. The, form, the most famous 
attack on contemporary theater of the renaissance was by stephen gosson he lambasted theater in his book the school of abuse containing a pleasant invective against poets pipers players jesters and such like caterpillars of commonwealth it is interesting that he dedicated his book to sir philip sidney he felt that these plays lacked purpose gosson critiqued tragedies for their evil and criminal themes and settings comedies for their bawdry flattery and immorality he also criticized characters which were drawn from amongst cooks knaves and parasites the charges leveled by stephen gosson against poetry were that poetry is a waste of time it is the mother of lies it is the nurse of abuse and he justified plato by saying that he was right to banish the poets from his ideal world the most important and significant defense of poetry was by sir philip sidney he wrote defense of poesy also called the apology for poetry another writer thomas lodge he pioneered an angry and irritated reply to gosson's attack on playwrights and poets in his defense of poetry he claimed that a handful of astray poets proved nothing about the whole set sir john harrington also defended poetry in his a brief apology for poetry he prefixed this to his translation uh, which was the first english translation of ariosto's orlando furioso he highlighted the various levels of signification that poetry allows it can be historical moral allegoric allegorical he elaborated on the various types of allegory he emphasized that the merits of verse were that it could ease memorizing it led to forcefulness of expression and it was entertaining to the ear he stressed the moral value of poetry by saying that it made people more honest and wise he also quoted examples from several poets including homer and dante to substantiate his views on poetry and its merits during this period there was a great deal of controversy whether poets should follow classical or native versification the conservatives of this period extolled poets who applied classical quantitative meters rhyme and even similes to poetry being written in english however there were others who said that this was very difficult and almost impossible why because the sound patterns of the two la- of the languages were different and also the spellings also varied George Chapman and Samuel Daniel were the ones who praised the classical meter and argued for it citing excellence of custom and nobility of the latin and greek tongues they felt that in order to attain perfection in any language it was necessary to model the language after the two classical languages that is latin and greek so philip sidney had praised spencer shepherd shepherd's calendar 
and Edward Kirk, who wrote the preface to the calendar, also praised Spencer because of his conformity to the ancients and the attempt to restore archaisms as they rightfully, he believed that they rightfully deserved to be brought back into the language. Others like Harvey, Campion and Bellet highlighted the inadequacy and inappropriacy of this argument. They focused on illustrating how English and French were different from the classical languages and therefore they showed the clumsiness that results when classical meter is applied to English verse. Francis Bacon wrote an important treatise, The Advancement of Learning. He was a humanist as well as an empiricist. He emphasized employing methods of reasoning, observation and verification rather than mere tradition and custom and faith. Bacon in the second book makes an in-depth analysis of the different branches of study. He differentiates between memory, which he says relates to history, imagination, which he relates to poetry, and reasoning, which he relates to philosophy. He places poetry above all these because he thinks that poetry is superior because it is a combination of the imagination and reason. And also, it is not limited by memory, history, or actual facts. Poetry, he believes, is feigned history. Why? Because the events and incidents of history can be changed and they can be presented so as to bring about a just to bring about poetic justice or to show the allocation of good and evil in a more just and fair basis than is actually done in real life. In, in that context, poetry seems to come closer to divine providence as it fulfills the aspirations of human beings. Today we have studied about the Renaissance. It was a period marked by a revival of interest in classical learning in the form of philosophy, literature, music, art and painting. The period was marked by a cultural movement called humanism. The Renaissance gave a great deal of importance to human beings and as a result, human beings were restored to the dignified place in the system of the universe. The Renaissance marked a departure from the thinking of the Middle Ages where human life was dependent on divine will and the directives of the church. Other things that we have studied in this module. Since human beings had become so important, therefore it was necessary to talk about the complete man, that is, the importance of certain virtues that were to be cultivated to make a complete man. Although the classical models were being followed, yet there was a lot of debate about whether the young poets should follow completely the classical models or they should adapt the work vernacular. A lot of emphasis was also given to the craft of writing poetry.
This period was also marked by a number of attacks that were made against poetry and poets. But there were many who defended poetry by saying that though a few bad poets did not necessarily mean that all poets were bad. Various kinds of poetries were talked about as well as the varieties of form, of meter and language. <laughs>